When I started my first company, one of our investors asked me how much of my own money I was putting into the company. At the time, I had very little liquidity. I was taking basically no salary. I was betting my whole life on it. And this person had like a portfolio. He was pulling a management fee. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, fuck you. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, how much are you putting in? You're not putting in anything. You have yeah. no skin in the game. You just have a job somewhere. I kind of view that stuff as the big difference between somebody who started a company in desperate times versus not, right? You kind of have that chip on your shoulder of like, I'm going to, I'm going to bet big because I don't have that many options in some sense. And so I think a lot of longevity in Silicon Valley is more just, can you move from one cycle to the next without effectively being displaced by that next wave? And how do you do that? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the episode you all been waiting for, clamoring for the comment section blowing up. Let me do, I written down this introduction because I wanted to do it right. We have sitting in our dining table, the one and only Elard Gill. Uh, woo. Elard, you know, as the saying goes, needs no introduction, um, uh, is an entrepreneur, operating executive. He's been an investor advisor to companies like Airbnb, Coinbase, Checker, Gusto, Instacart, Open Door, Pinterest, Square, Stripe, Wish. There's several more on that list, trust me. Uh, uh, he is co founder and a chairman at Color Genomics and was formerly CEO of the company. And before that, was VP of corporate strategy at Twitter, which I actually forgot about. Uh, after Twitter acquired uh, Mixer Labs and was also product manager once at Google working on mobile maps. He's the author of the highly amazing uh, high growth handbook from Stripe Press, which I highly recommend. But this introduction does not capture how central of a figure Elad is to the world that we live in of uh, technology, founders, startups, and investing. Elad's really the institutions. Elad! Welcome to the show. Uh, yeah, thanks for including me. I feel like whenever people say that this person doesn't need an introduction and then and then they introduce them, they clearly need an introduction. <laughs> so I think it's always ironic. But you don't. Uh, but you don't, yeah, right? We don't. can edit that out. You are right? special. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I uh, we are in a little WhatsApp group chat and the other day, and I used an obscure reference where uh, I called Elad uh, Tom Bombadil from Lord of the Rings, as in a figure who has been here way before us and will be here way after us. Uh, really a, a institution... It's a way to say old. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much. yes <laughs> Politely. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, but really, an, it's easy, an institution of Silicon Valley. And, you know, maybe, you know, one very quick place to start off is how do you find the energy and enthusiasm to keep doing this? Because you've been involved in investing startup founders for over a decade. What motivates you? How do you keep doing this? Yeah, I guess there's two separate answers. I mean, on the one hand, I'm a techno-optimist. I view technology as a force for good. And, um, you know, ultimately, I view being participating in the technology ecosystem as a way to help drive human progress forward. And that's my primary motivator. And so I'm just excited by new technology. I'm excited by people working on it. And I'm excited by the importance of it. Um, that's one answer. The other answer is a decade isn't that long of a time in reality. <laughs> and in Silicon Valley, it is because I think um, ultimately technology um, and technology startups kind of move in these six or seven year cycles or five to seven year cycles where the people who are relevant on all levels turn over. Mm -hmm. In other words, who are the interesting founders uh, that other founders look up to and aspire to be, right? And I yeah. think we're, um, who are the angels that everybody wants to raise money from? Who are the uh, companies that people want to build business models similar to? Mm -hmm. And I feel like right now we're actually going through one of those transition points where the relevancy or the people who are relevant switches. And I think it's very difficult for people to be relevant across cycles. And there's a handful of people who are, but many aren't. And so I think a lot of longevity in Silicon Valley is more just, can you move from one cycle to the next without effectively being displaced by that next wave? And how do you do that? Well, I, I don't know if I've done it that effectively, but I think fundamentally it's just being being involved with things that are interesting, either in terms of new technologies, like what's happening now in AI, and mm -hmm. coming to those things perhaps early. Um, it could be uh, the companies that you either start or are involved with right, yeah. right now. You know, a number of companies, Rippling, Deal, Notion, et cetera, Ramp, uh, Brex are sort of part of that next wave in some sense yeah. when the prior wave, and these are still amazing companies that everybody aspires to, to be like, are things like Stripe and Figma and other companies. And so, right. you, you, or, you know, prior waves were Uber and Square and uh, Twitter, and before that it was Facebook and Google. And, I, you know, I, I should have named probably a dozen other companies, right? So hopefully nobody's offended by hmm. inadvertent omission. It's just you see these kind of waves happen, and then the founders that are relevant change. The angels come out of those networks of those companies. Right. The VCs, every five years, there's a new VC platform that launches and gains relevance. And so it's just, it's just a generational turnover, and generation is a very short time. Yeah, so maybe I want to unpack some of the history of it, right? So 
what was your first ever angel check investment or, or the first few that you think is interesting, relevant that you can think of? Second part of it is, yeah, I'm kind of curious to hear you chart maybe some of the network, some of the platforms that have turned over. Maybe let's kind of walk through history a bit. But what was your first check? You know, I don't remember what the first check was necessarily. There's a mm-hmm. few things that I invested in in roughly the same time because, you know, I left Google. I had very, um, I didn't have a lot of money when I left. I was starting my own company. I was taking basically no salary, right? And so a lot of the first um, investments that I made were quite small and they were in friends of mine and things like that. And so um, I invested in Airbnb. That was one of the first probably two or three companies I invested in. How did, how did that happen? Um, how did you meet Brian or? I met them at some like networking event or something and we just started talking. And then as they were raising their series A, I, um, I kind of suggested a few people and helped a little bit with back channel and things like that. So as part of that, they, they asked if I wanted to participate in the round. And so it, it just kind of happened a bit organically. Mm. Um, you know, I funded uh, one or two companies that no longer exist now. Um, I funded some things that are still up and running, like a minted or, mm. um, uh, you know, things like that. So it was a little bit of a, a bunch of happenstance, right? Because I was just starting company myself and all my friends were roughly founders. And those are the people that I would hang out with and do stuff with. And we just gave each other advice. And as part of that, people just started asking me if I wanted to invest. How much has your rubric for how to invest the kind of person that you want to invest in change over these years? You know, it's an interesting question because fundamentally, or maybe there's two different answers to that, right? On the one hand, um, I care more about the product market than the team for companies simply because I think that I've seen amazing teams get absolutely crushed um, by that, bad that's markets. That's actually a controversial opinion. A lot of people pick founders over product market or... Yeah, you know, most early space. stage investors say that the single most important thing is the founder. Yeah. And I've started two companies, right? I think founders yeah, yeah. are really important, right? It's not, <laughs> it's not as I don't have an appreciation yeah, for yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's more just I've seen amazing people that I really respect get absolutely demolished by uh, being in a terrible market. And then I've seen people who are quite mediocre mm. and not very good actually in terms of execution or product or anything do great. Right. Because they just happen to be in the right market. And so, you know, an example of a company that was never viewed as incredibly functional was Twitter, right? That was amazing product market fit. Mm-hmm. When they bought my first company, um, they hadn't been able to deploy code for a couple months or something. Right. And so the first thing my team did, we were supposed to be building all these geo features into the product after the acquisition was we went and we fixed a deploy queue so they could deploy co- So they actually pushed changes to the website, right? But they had amazing product market fit. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so it just, you know, it became a tens of billions of dollar company. And um, continue to have it now. And continue to yeah. have it now. And yeah. so, um, you know, the first thing I care about is product market. After that, obviously, it's founders. And then from a founder selection perspective, it's things like, um, you know, are, is, do the people learn rapidly? Um, do they have the ability to synthesize information and come to their own opinions? Mm. Are they driven... Um, I, I think a lot in terms of our founders desperate for something, mm. are they desperate for a better career and better life? Are they desperate for impact? Are they desperate for a product that doesn't exist that they really want? And I think mm. what happened over the last four or five years during COVID and a little bit before that, all the desperation went out of the ecosystem because startups became a status thing right. and mm-hmm. you could take out a lot of money during secondary. And so you got a lot of kind of LARPing, you know, mm. you had a lot of people kind of showing up and role-playing versus like really being driven to do something. Mm-hmm. And in in the absence of an infinite capital environment, things are really hard and you need desperation to drive you. Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't see a VP at Facebook usually starting a company. It's because there's no desperation. It's huge opportunity costs. It's the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one kind of approach. The other is I think of it in the context of, um, it's almost like if you look at the early founding team of Apple or just look at Apple over time, you had uh, Steve Jobs Mm -hmm. who could basically sell anything and could think about product. You had Steve Wozniak who could build anything. And later you had Tim, Tim Cook who could like scale things and run mm-hmm. things. And, right. and I think in the life of a startup, you need those three archetypes in some mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. And usually at the founding stage, you need somebody who can build and somebody who can sell. Mm-hmm. And selling means convincing employees to join. It means mm-hmm. raising money. It mm-hmm. means getting early customers. It means any form of sales. Mm-hmm. And so often when I look at founding teams, I wonder, you know, do they have the builder and do they have the, the salesperson? And sometimes it's the same person. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's different people or it's sort of distributed across the team. And then later in the life of a company, if you don't have it internally, you need to bring on somebody who can be like the Tim Cook who scales it. Right. Mm-hmm. it you actually dropped a bunch of, I think, bombs in there in the previous mm-hmm. bit, uh, uh, which I would kind of ta- characterize as the zero rate environment, which I think is kind of the phrase everyone's been using for the last few years of the fundraising scene. How do you judge the desperation of a founder uh, when you're meeting them for the first time or at a party or in a pitch meeting? What are you asking? What are you looking for? Because everyone, I think, knows 
you know, the right things to say, they know to say, uh, to never say like, oh, I'm looking for an exit, I'm looking for capital. Everyone knows the right yeah. woke it's, shibboleths as uh, SBF might say. I think it's okay if somebody's looking for an exit, right? Because yeah. Larry and Sergey, when they started Google, famously tried to uh, shop the original search engine for like a million dollars, mm-hmm. right? Or Zuck almost sold a Yahoo mm-hmm. for a billion dollars, right? So I think it's, um, it's something that VCs say. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, uh, but yeah, the reality is as a founder, you, you know, before this crazy environment that we had for four or five years, you would talk about it with your friends, right? You'd oh, yeah. say like, well, maybe I could sell this thing and like, yep. I'd be yeah. pretty happy, right? Yeah. And so I think it's like an investor perspective, <laughs> not a founder perspective. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of um, when I started my first company, um, one of our investors um, asked me um, how much of my own money I was putting into the company, right? And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the time I had very little, um, liquidity. Uh, I was taking basically no salary I was betting my whole life on it. And this person had like a portfolio. He was pulling a management fee. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, fuck you. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> like, how much are you putting in? You're not putting in anything. You have yeah. no skin in the game. You just have a job somewhere. Right. Yeah. And so I kind of view that stuff as, is uh, the big difference between somebody who started a company in desperate times versus, not right. You kind of have that chip on your shoulder of like, I'm going to, I'm going to bet big because I don't have that many options in some sense. By the way, I love that you brought up the company selling point because in some ways uh, it's a level of artifice because if somebody came and offered you, said, you're going to be worth nine digits, 10 digits at the end of this, there'd be yeah. no human being who would not take this seriously, right? Like you have to take this seriously and uh, everyone take it seriously. No, but so, also I think uh, you've seen founders say this being like, oh, we're not going to sell for any amount, but the early employees who joined, they would be okay with it. Like mm-hmm. they would want like a reasonable exit. I think it's a little bit disingenuous to be like, no amount of money. This is the world's greatest company yep. and kind of pull that shtick. Uh, I, I think when someone says that, it's more a sign of have they read all the right blog posts and all to watch all the right videos, which tell you not to say that. Yeah. Or mm. how much did they take off of in secondary? Because the founders can always say that the early employees will look at it and go, no, don't speak for me. Like I'm, I'm okay with like a pretty mm-hmm. large exit. Yeah. And I think, I think there are occasionally rare founders who, um, really view something as either a life's mission or yeah. they really just, they built it because they really wanted this thing to exist. Yeah. You see that in some of the AI scene right now where there's yeah. people who truly, truly want to build AGI, right? Yeah. Or uh, you see that in certain biotechs where somebody's family member was so deeply affected that they're really, really trying to solve a problem. Right. Um, so it does happen sometimes, but I think um, you, I think there's a real, there's real, there's real value to being disingenuous as a founder because VCs won't back you. Mm-hmm. If you say, yeah, you know, if it's a short, if it's a quick exit, I'm fine with it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but the reality is a lot of founders are thinking that right. up until this recent period where there's infinite secondary and everything was always doing better. And so why right. would you ever right. sell? Right. Right. Um, right. One of the things I actually suggest to, to people running companies to do uh, private companies is, and I think Ben Horwitz may have written about this is, um, you know, I, I suggest that once a year you pre-plan the board meeting and you say every year we're going to do a board meeting where we're going to talk about whether we should sell the company. Mm. And we're going to talk about who we could sell to, whether it makes any sense, like under what conditions would it make sense. And it's just an annual agenda item. So it's non-emotional. Right. It doesn't indicate the founders want to sell. Right. It doesn't indicate the board members do or don't. Right. Mm-hmm. It just means we should have a rational conversation as shareholders in this company. Right. As fiduciaries. Right. And if the decision is not to sell the whole time, great. But it, it at least forces the conversation in a more open, honest, non-charged forum. So I think that's very, mm-hmm. that, that, you know, that's really worth doing. Yeah, the other theme I think which you touched on is the startup as status symbol, which I would tie also to the general fundraising environment over the last few years, uh, where I think it, there was a period of time when you were, say, an ex-FANG uh, you know, leader or you know, somebody with the right credentials. It was probably fairly easy for you to raise a seed round of fundraising. A, what do you think happens to a lot of those companies now? How do you see the current fundraising market at, say, the seed stage to start off with? Yeah, so I think what happened is um, for four or five years, nobody sold their company because they didn't have to Mm. and because they didn't want to because you could take out a lot of secondary. And so it used to be the rule of thumb for secondary. And I'm pro-secondary, by the way. Like, you know, when I sold my company to Twitter, I I was able to sell some secondary in a company-approved way. And, like, that was great, right? It gave me some liquidity before the company went public. um, And I really appreciated that. Um, the rule used to be the company that you start should be worth at least 500 million ish 
which at the time was a sign that it was clearly working. Mm. You had some revenue, it was ramping well, and you'd kind of hit a milestone. You, usually that valuation meant you were three-ish, four years into the company. Yeah. And so you're far enough along that you knew the thing was going to work and you didn't leave anybody holding the bag and you take out some money so that you could keep going without yep. feeling stress. And then what happened is that kept shifting earlier and earlier. Yeah. And during the bubble of COVID, the um, rounds com- compressed in time. So it used to be before COVID, it would be every 12 to 18 months you'd raise a round. Yeah. Because then you'd have enough progress as a company to show a big step function. Mm-hmm. During COVID, the timelines compressed to three to six months. Hmm. So there wasn't a lot of new information, but it also meant that you raised three, four rounds of fundraising in 12, 18 months, when before you'd only do one round every 12 to 18 months, right? right. And so instead of going from your C to your A, you went from your C to your Series C. Mm-hmm. And you're dramatically overcapitalized, mm-hmm. but also at every round you took out money. So mm-hmm. before you'd never take out your any money at your seed or your A or potentially your B, but you know, often it'd be your B. Um, but during COVID people would take out money in the seed and they take out money in the A and they take out money in the B. Mm-hmm. And so the secondary environment, and this got is really all pre-revenue distorted. even yeah. pre-revenue, pre necessarily any traction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it was, it was a very rational way to cash out, mm-hmm. right? If you think about it, um, because if you think about the average, um, exit, you know, if you can take out five or $10 million, that's a huge amount of money. Yeah. Right. That's a, that used to be a successful exit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you didn't do anything. You just kind of had a I company. I mean, for most people, even in the U.S., it's like a life changing amount of money. It's a, it's a it's a huge amount of money. And so. Um, so why did we become OK with that? That just it never made sense to me. Like why through COVID we were all OK with this, like three to six month fundraising rounds for B to C to D. Like that just mm-hmm. why were we OK with that? I think it was probably four things. Yeah. Uh, low interest rates. Low interest rates was one. So yeah. cost of capital was cheap. Um, the deployment pace picked up dramatically, I think in part because people were stuck at home all day and they didn't have anything better to do on either yeah, side. Yeah. Um, in part because people moved to zoom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the velocity went up, um, everything was an up market. So everything looked good and the comps kept going up. So more, the relative yeah. bar changed. There is no one player in the market who caused this. It was really everyone reacted to the market in the sense there was capital coming in, um, capital looking for places to be deployed. Uh, so a lot of funds. And so when you have so much capital coming in, right, like everything went up, right? Valuations went up, uh, you know, what you wound up offering to founders went up. So every actor was acting rationally given the situation. So if you're competing, yeah. you know, you could start offering a secondary or you could start, uh, you know, you change the valuation. So everyone else starts responding to that. And if you're a founder, yeah. uh, I remember, I think Stuart Butterfield uh, said this, like if somebody's offering cookie, you take a cookie. So there is yeah. not one actor who was in yeah, no, I mean, the incentive to some extent, to your point, was public market valuations shot way up. Mm-hmm. A bunch mm-hmm. of people went public. They had massive outcomes. So it suddenly looked like everything in venture worked. So LPs and venture capital firms are willing to give way more money to venture capitalists. Venture capitalists were very happy to aggregate that capital and some, in some cases make a lot of money off the management fee, whether the investments would work or not. They increased their pace and velocity of investment dramatically. And on the founder side, you both had these public market comps go up, um, but also you had secondaries and incentive to drive your valuation up as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Because you were selling into the rounds, so you wanted the round price to be very high mm-hmm. versus saying, well, I'll do something in between so that I can raise the next round because that mm-hmm. wasn't your incentive. Right. Your right. incentive was to take right. money out. So all these things to your point work together right. and the incentives all aligned. Um, and the incentives aligned because we had this 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 COVID set of lockdowns and then we printed a lot of money and distributed a lot of capital to try and prevent the ramifications of that lockdown. Yeah. What do you think happens to those companies now? Because it seems like there are a lot of companies who raise significant amounts of capital, you know, have varying amounts of runway, but you know, they don't run out of runway anytime soon. But to your point, they often um, not often, but uh, quite a few of them don't have maybe traction product market sure. fit, but don't have the need to raise a round anytime soon. Yeah. What happens to the entire class of companies? Yeah. So I, I, I would divide it up by phase. The early stage companies will be fine, right? They'll, if you're five people and you're trying to build your first product, you'll just try and build your first product and get your first few customers and it's fine. I actually was running a startup when um, Sequoia did their famous Rest in Peace Good Times talk. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. a Sequoia back company. So I went to it. Uh, during the great financial crisis and we were like a five or six person company and I went up afterwards and said, hey, what should we do? And they're like, don't worry about it. You're fine. You're a five person company. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is true right now for like a five person company, except, um, you know, make sure that you make it to the next milestone in terms of revenue Mm -hmm. and all the rest, but standard advice. Um, If you're a late stage or mid stage company, it depends on where you are, right? Mm -hmm. Are you profitable? Uh, Have you looked at sort of uh, different types of burn ratios or things like that? Like what what are the metrics, right? And unfortunately, what happened is during the last two years of COVID, um, 
money was so abundant and valuations kept going higher and higher. And as mentioned, the timeline compressed. So everybody got a free round or two. Mm -hmm. So everybody was overcapitalized and many companies way overhired yes. relative to their progress. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it used to be you had a million in an ARR, two million in ARR, you're probably a 15-person company, right? Yeah, no, no um, longer the case. You're during, looking at like five times that now. Yeah. yeah, during COVID, you ended up with like 100 people yeah. with the same yeah. amount of revenue. Yeah. And you had a billion dollar valuation and you had a hundred million dollars in the bank when yeah. really, you know, maybe you should have had a $50 million, hundred million dollar valuation mm -hmm. and, you know, $10 million. And so all the behavior shifted, you way over hired. And now those companies are stuck with enormous overhead, high burn, uh, really screwed up cap table in some cases mm -hmm. and very little revenue, potentially no product market fit. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see, um, a subset of those companies be fine and grow out of it and yeah. be great. And yeah. then we're going to see a lot of carnage. And that's going to probably start um, around Q2, Q3 of this year and last about mm. a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason it starts then is because most of the money that was raised was, was in 2021. Year. Yeah. And then yeah. some people did a bump last year that gave yeah. them another 12 months or whatever. So yeah. for the ones that only raised in 2021, they had two to three years of money. So that's going to be right around middle of this year to middle yeah. of 2024. Yeah. Right. Um, if you have a bump, maybe it extends it a little bit more. Um, and then people are often... Um, misdoing things like layoffs, right? So mm. for example, um, if you have a million in revenue and a hundred people, maybe you should cut your team down really dramatically, mm. right? 30 people, yeah. 25 people, yeah. right? Assuming you're growing. Yeah. Um, and if you're not growing? And if you're not growing, um, maybe you should shut down and return money or maybe yeah. you should sell the company. No one, no um, one's going to do that though. I, I think mm -hmm. part of it, I think is just, we've set these companies uh, in a poor way, culturally, from the get-go, right? Like this wave of this cohort of companies, I think if you look at them, when an employee joins, the first question they ask around is like, how many people are there? And the founder then is like, we have 50 people. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, yeah, you must be legit. Like the questions that are being asked are not, how much revenue are you making? Uh -huh. um, you know, like, yeah, you're a Series C company, Series D company, but what, like, you yeah, know, I is it working? I think that's changing. I think yeah. that's changing. I think, um, I think also a lot of people have now seen enough of their friends get laid off yeah. mm -hmm. that they're expecting the layoff at their company. Yeah. And I think it's an opportunity for the leadership of companies to cut really deeply if they yeah. need to. Yeah. Not every company needs to, right? Some yeah. should just be growing right now. Yeah. Um, but if you need to, the problem is if you cut 10%, you're not really making any change. Yeah. What, one of my friends told me, like the magic number, everyone's like either they pick 6% or 13%. And, it's 13%, you know, yeah, uh, and, people, um, yeah. And why is that? Because I think there is this trend where people are cutting then they find out they haven't cut enough. Then they have to do it again, which is brutal to morale and sure. all sorts of other dynamics. So yeah. if you're a founder and CEO listening to this and you know that you might have to do something else, what do you tell them? Yeah, so I've had these conversations, right? And often you'll go through the projections for the year. And um, many people do not have a true downside case. I was talking to another um, like well-known investor about this who does a lot of SaaS. And his view was that you know, a lot of people have 2x growth in their model. And they think they're going to do 1.8x. Mm. They're like, oh, our down version is 1.8x. And he's yep. like, they're going to grow 40% this year. Yep. Because their NRR, their net, net revenue retention, will shrink because yep. people are cleaning up the number of seats. Yep. They're not Actually, adding SaaS people. Businesses, yeah. Right? Yeah. Or they're shrinking their teams. Yeah. And so your customers are going to shrink their budget and shrink yep. their team. Yep. So your retention is going to go down. And the new business is going to take longer. Yep. And so suddenly, instead of a 2x thing with the 1.8x downside, you're at 0. 0.4 growth. Yep. Yeah. But your team is set up to do 1.8x, mm -hmm. which means you have way too many people. Yeah. And so one is you should scenario model the disaster scenario. Yeah. Um, but also you should look at it and say, A, how much cash do I actually have and how do I get there? How do I get to, yeah. you know, a long enough amount that I can outlive this period? Yeah. Um, but also maybe how, how do I have enough money to make it to profitability or something else? Because um, people may not fund you again. Right. I talk to a right. lot of people who say the worst case is we do a down round. Yeah. And the worst case is you go out of business, right? Yeah, it's nothing yeah, to do a down yeah. round. And yeah. so you model it out and you say, okay, how deep of a cut should I do? And one company I was talking to felt that they should do 50% mm. and they wanted to do 20%. Mm. And I said, well, if you know that you should do 50%, why are you doing 20%? Yeah. And they said, employee optics. We're worried what the team will think. But the team will be happy with an outcome that is somewhat positive than mm -hmm. just complete destruction of value. You know. Yeah, and the second and third rounds of layoffs that you'll yep. have to do oh, yeah. after you burn extra cash. Yep. Yep. Right. So you're making it way less stable of a company for everyone in the long run because you're yeah. worried to do the hard thing in the short run. Yeah. And so I think that's back to the um, desperate founders tend to be more um, 
uh, uh, what's the right word without, I'm, I'm looking for the right word, tend to be more willful about some of these things mm-hmm. because um, desperation drives hard acts. And yeah. I think that, yeah. you know, the, the, we had a very easy period for a while on a relative basis, right? Mm-hmm. Startups were still hard, but it was mm-hmm. easier than it had been in mm-hmm. a while. Uh, with some counterexamples of hiring and things like that. And so I think um, there's certain things that sometimes you just have to do if you really want your company to be healthy. Yeah. The, the other version of this that I think is kind of interesting is we've been seeing a lot of layoffs in the public companies, right? The big, you know, the huge companies, the Googles, the Metas, uh, and so on. Um, you know, first is, you know, one of the things that starts really blew my mind yesterday. I knew it, but I saw it compared was how much these companies had grown as a percentage of employee base over the last few years, like some of them have doubled from a really big yeah. base over the last uh, couple of years. So A, you know, what do you think is going to happen in these large fan companies? Um, and B, do you think culturally this is going to mean more being hardcore, quote unquote, where you're doubling down, mm-hmm. you are focusing more on just the core parts of your business and things which sure. may seem distractions or maybe not as core get thrown out the window? Yeah. Yeah. I think that if you look at... Um the mama companies, right? Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft. <laughs> I know and, you're trying um, to socialize you, you that. You can't beam this into existence. <laughs> I keep trying. Because Fang doesn't really, A, Fang sounds really like badass. Ominous, yeah. Um, but also like... It's not even accurate anymore. I just also think Netflix's model is so radically different from these other companies. Yeah. Just, well, Fang is incorrect because there is no, Facebook is no Meta. Microsoft's yeah. not even in there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's why so. it's mama. So anyhow, um, if you look at these companies, <laughs> you know, uh, Meta went from 44,000 to over 88,000 people, mm-hmm. and then it laid off 11,000, right? Yeah. That, and by the way, 44,000 to 88,000 was two years. Two years, yeah. And so laying off 11,000 basically took it back in time eight months or something. It didn't yeah. change anything, right? Uh, Google, or I guess now Alphabet, went from um, 110 to 190,000 people over two years. Wow. And then they laid off 6%, which is nothing, right? Again, it just didn't matter. And I actually think this is a reflection of how good their business models are. Yeah. It's not actually a reflection of, um, and you know, some parts of these companies were operated really well. The people there that I know, like a subset are just exceptional, right? Mm-hmm. But the flip side of it is there's a lot of fat on these yeah. companies and there's yeah. a lot of leeway. And it's just a reflection of these are amazing businesses. These are some of the best businesses ever seen on the planet. Mm-hmm. And that's why they get away with it, right? It's just the business model is so good. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the way it should be operated, right? Twitter Great example where they um, ended up with reducing the company by 75% and the shipping velocity has gone up. Site hasn't gone down, still keeps Site hasn't gone down. They've made all sorts of changes. Um, to the disappointment of many, I think. Disappointment of many. I mean, I feel like Twitter is an example where they probably did a lot of the right things, but they did them poorly in terms of how they communicate. It was very yeah. ham-handed and yeah, yeah, yeah. came across as very mean and um, non-respectful. Yeah you know, to the people involved. And I thought that was poorly done, but the flip of it is, it was probably the right set of actions in terms of what the situation was for the company. I almost think this is like a really good opportunity for founders, like early stage founders, when you compare against like these really large incumbents who are already there, like, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. Founders now have, if they have the courage to do it, they can now cut fat. Um, There's probably much smaller to start with. And if you're able to lead your company out of this phase and just focus on growth, like channel that desperation into like actually growing the business, uh, you could probably come out of this way better than like what would have been an outcome if that continued like low interest rate period, right? Like it's like you now have a chance to be really disciplined, really focus on growth, back to fundamentals. You can use this as a chance to you know, not focus on the non-core stuff. Uh, and just, it's almost like it's advantages to founders, I would think. Yeah, I think if your company fundamentally is working, yeah, then everything you said makes a ton of sense and is yeah. very true. If your company's not working, you have to decide, do you want to sell? Do you want to restart what you're doing? Yeah. Do you want to shut down? Or, you yeah. know, what are your, you have like a, a limited set mm-hmm. of choices. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'm surprised hasn't happened very much right now and may happen or may not happen is there's some companies that are sitting on enormous amounts of cash mm-hmm. without the company actually working. Twenty million dollars, thirty mm-hmm. million dollars of cash mm-hmm. still. Mm-hmm. Actually, sometimes a lot more. Uh, yeah, quite a bit more. And um, I'm waiting for the M and A market where effectively you buy a private company buys that company for the cash is mm. effectively a financing round. Oh, uh, because oh, I actually thought you were going to say something. I thought it's going to be more like a SPAC. Well, not a SPAC, but a situation where you have a cash and there's reverse a reverse SPAC. Well, it's more like you have no product market fit, but you have money yeah. and you have somebody else who 
needs capital and you basically yeah. buy them um, and you know you kind of become that company. Yeah, it's effectively buying a round of financing. Yeah. And the investors in the original company with all the cash and the founders are almost like doing an investment and they're getting equity back in exchange right. and a subset right, of the team right, sticks right. around. Um, and the because so many valuations wrote up, the mm. people who are buying the company with their equity for the cash may have overvalued equity, but they may still have upside on it. So you may be willing to do that as the, as the seller. Uh, one structure that I think is M&A is actually an interesting skill. And I think it's and I think it's a learned skill for a lot of founders, and it's not the most natural thing to them. So mm-hmm. the, I, I definitely think founders should think about doing that. But if you're a founder who's really focused on product, team building, sure. engineering, yeah, totally. you don't think of like going out and buying. It's not the first thing that you do. In fact, if you look at some of the great founders over time, like some like Zuckerberg, right? It's actually amazing. The, Instagram, mm-hmm. WhatsApp, right? A lot of these were like geniuses of M&A as much as was product and engineering. I, I want to, just on the fundraising side, let us say you are a seed founder right now, right? W- how do you think about raising a round for a seed or a series A? Yeah, I don't think the seed market has changed very much. Mm-hmm. Um, I still think that um, financings are happening at a pretty fast pace on a relative basis. They take longer than they used to. Mm-hmm. So it isn't necessarily one week and suddenly you have the money, right? <laughs> Which was happening during COVID. Mm-hmm. You know, traditionally it used to take uh, one to three months to raise a round of financing for early financing. And then if you're doing a series A, it used to take two, four, two to four months. Yeah. And that's sort of still the norm. part of the course right now. Um, yeah. So I think it's kind of going back to that. I think yeah. the later the round, the harder it is because you're both stuck with an overhang and valuation, but the bar has always also gone way up in terms of what people are expecting now for mm-hmm. progress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think later rounds are tougher and I think it's still cascading back because usually when you have a market correction, it starts in the public markets and it takes round by round, you get yeah. adjustments and it, you, the adjustments happen when, you know, series B companies start not being able to raise a C very well and most of them fail and selling the people who are going from A to B say, oh my gosh, all my B's are failing. I better drop the price on future mm. B's so that I can mm-hmm. make it right. Mm. And so then the A's come down. Right. Because they're like, oh, I can't make it. The Bs are coming down, so the A's come down. So it kind of cascades, cascades backwards down. in time. Mm-hmm. So we and haven't takes quite time. seen that yet. Yeah, yeah, C does come down somewhat, but yeah. it's still a very active market. Um, and that's largely driven, I think, by the multi-stage firms versus like the angel community. The mm-hmm. people with lots and lots of capital are still deploying it very aggressively at the earliest stages. Mm-hmm. And some people who are mainly later stage are coming down stage because they view that as the only place with real opportunities right now. What do you think happens to the class of uh, early stage funds, solo capitalists, uh, which you know we saw a lot of over the last few years, and I think you and I are kind of friends involved with several of them. Do you think we see a change in that? Do you see some of them consolidating? Do you see? Do you think we still see new ones? What what happens there? Yeah, I think it's a um, you know it's interesting if you go back in history, Arthur Rock in the 1980s was a solo capitalist. And this is somebody who's famous for like funding Apple and Intel and all these things, right? And so, you know, there's a long history of of people like that existing. I think fundamentally, um, usually the evolution of those types of firms is one of three paths, right? The people decide that they want to go do something else. Mm -hmm. The people keep going in a solo capacity or the people start a firm or formalize what they're doing more, right? Those are kind of the patterns and I'm sure we'll see those patterns. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll continue to see people starting funds on their own. And then evolving in different directions. And so I kind of view it as not, uh, I think the thing that shifted really in the 20, the late 20 teens was um, solo investors became multi stage yep. mm-hmm. when before they were only early stage. And you personally are probably the prototype of some of, uh, of that phenomenon right there. Because the, the most popular question I got uh, from some of our friends when they knew I was having you was, you know, why hasn't, hey, two parts. One, how does Elard, you know, continue to scale so well being a solo uh, capitalist, you work by yourself or you know, very, very small kind of support. Um, and why, you know, there's an alternate world where you could start a firm, build a large platform, et cetera. But here you are, you know, you show up, you do things by yourself. Why is that? Do you just not like people? Do I not like people? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, so a few things. Uh, one is, you know, um, my investing is split in a variety of ways. I still do some angel checks mm-hmm. on my own. Um, there are times where I do things that are more institutional in nature, um, in terms of funds, SPVs, et cetera. Um, but you know, I've managed large teams in the past, right? Like I run companies and I've run big teams at different organizations. And so I enjoy doing that. Um, you know, I don't know what specific path I'm going to take over time. Like I think the Mm. future is uncertain, but, uh, you know, fundamentally, I think each person kind of chooses their own direction. And I think if you look at the ecosystem in general, um, you know, it used to be that the only way that you could really raise large amounts of money is you went to a platform yeah. and then 
that was the mechanism to do it. Mm -hmm. And now there's more willingness in the ecosystem to back individuals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some people who may have been excellent investors at one of the big platforms, um, decided they're just going to go off on their own. And in some cases, um, this is not my case, but in some cases, uh, it may be rational for them to do that because they're, they're very good at it. And instead of being one of 10 people at a firm and the other nine aren't great, which sometimes happens, you know, they can just kind of do the, the pure investing if they want to. Yeah. Right. But I think it really depends on the person. Like, yeah. So what happens then, you know, we talked about early stage, what happens to like a series E, F, you know, the ones waiting to go public, what happens to public markets or startups getting into public markets? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the window to public markets is, um, reasonably closed right now, right? So right. it's hard for companies to right. IPO or direct list. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are waiting for that to reopen. And the question is, when does that happen and under what circumstances and, yeah. Uh, which companies can go out for a second, third, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a big open question right now. Right. Uh, one last thing before we kind of switch gears is um, we talked a lot about layoffs, et cetera. And I think a lot of people on the other side of layoffs, they've been laid off, their friends have been laid off, sure. or they're worried about being laid off. They're thinking about career paths, um, skill sets. And this is coming after, you know, several years where if you had, say, like a PM job at Google or at Facebook, you pretty much thought you were safe, right? Like, you know, sure. you, you knew what your comp was. You thought you were going to, you know, plus RSUs, you're going to make that. Yeah. So for those folks who are listening and, you know, obviously they're impacted, we feel uh, really empathetic towards them or just nervous. Sure. How should they think about this time? I think it really depends where you're at. I mean, if you look at Google, they added 90,000 people and then they reduced by whatever it was, 12,000 or 14,000 mm -hmm. or the exact number. So they net added, what is that, like 70,000 people-ish? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That seems pretty safe to me. <laughs> I don't know. So I think um, it really depends on where you're at. I think the reality is, um, you know, particularly in startups, people will continue to reduce the teams. Mm -hmm. And it's going to accelerate, in my opinion, and I could be wrong, mid of this year through mid of 2024. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be a period where the market is really unstable. And... Um, you know, some companies will continue to grow and will be kind of the winners and will benefit from that. They'll aggregate all the best talent. That was Google in, you know, 2002, 2003, all the, all 2001 through 2003, 2004, because all the companies in the dot-com era were laying people off and Google sucked up all the great people mm -hmm. right. and they sucked up all the founders. And that's right. why they did so many amazing things. So companies will have that opportunity for the companies to continue to grow. And so to some extent, if you can land at one of the true breakouts, one of these aspirational generational companies, mm -hmm. that's going to be an amazing place to be and it's going to have enormous talent density. That's where mm -hmm. all the best people are going to flock to for the next year or two. Mm -hmm. And that can make the rest of your career. Um, also, if you look at tech talent in general, it's been very sparse for the rest of the country. Yeah. And so if you look outside of the core tech industry, lots and lots of enterprises want to hire tech talent and they just haven't had access to it before. So I think there's going to be lots of homes for people who have been trained at a Google or been trained at a well-known startup yeah. because the rest of the country is hungry mm -hmm. for human yeah. capital. Is this a good time to start a company? Yeah, I think it's a, a very good time to start a company. Um, there's still plentiful seed capital. Uh, there's still big technology problems to address. There's big technology waves mm -hmm. like AI and SaaS that are still happening. Um, you know, talent will be easier. Mm. The harder thing may end up being if... Uh, we increasingly move into a recession, mm. buying behavior may slow for certain types of enterprises, yep. but depending on what you build, maybe it accelerates if what you're doing is actually a cost-cutting cost product. Cutting. So yeah. it kind of depends. Yeah. Yeah. Which, okay, this may be a good segue, right? Which is probably, you know, the other real segment that we wanted to spend time on with you, which you mentioned AI. You've been active in AI for quite a bit of time, actually, I think, um, you know, both, uh, even before you were an investor uh, in, in some ways. Uh, so uh, maybe one good place to start is, we're doing this, recording this in January 2023. Sum up maybe the AI startup state of the union that as you see it right now. So, uh, you know, from, from a background perspective, um, to your point, you know, I worked at Google and at Google I did two things. I started the mobile team and then I worked on machine learning uh, for ads targeting. Or I should say I was working on the ads targeting system, which were very machine learning driven. Mm. Uh, I was a product manager, so I wasn't actually writing the code for it, but I was involved with some of these early systems. And then mm. I left to start a company that was a data infrastructure company, the Twitter bot. And then at Twitter, one of the teams that um, worked for me was a search team. So again, mm -hmm. very sort of ML centric. Mm -hmm. And then I- Which by the way, weirdly enough, several years later, I took over. So, oh, really? yeah, oh yeah, so, like, all sorts of, yeah. yeah, yeah everyone yeah. has had like some time at Twitter. Yeah, yeah, everybody, it's like, uh, yeah, exactly. I won't make the analogy that I was thinking of. And then, um, 
<laughs> you know, I started Color, which was doing, um, which was applying certain aspects of machine learning mm -hmm. to, to genomic data. And then I invested in AI for about a decade. And for a decade, nothing worked. Mm. Um, all the value in the AI ecosystem basically went to incumbents, right? And uh, that was things like Netflix recommendations and the yeah. Facebook newsfeed and yeah. Alexa from Amazon and all yeah. these things. But the startups in that era, most of them just didn't yield much. Why do you think that is? You know, I think it's a few things. I think one is um, it wasn't good enough. Yeah. You know, it was better yeah. technology. Yeah. And in the hands of an incumbent that had distribution, it, it, you know, if it makes something 2x better, that's great. But it wasn't 10x better where suddenly yeah. you can change the nature of the product and the experience yeah. relative to an incumbent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you had this enormous incumbent wave of, of mm -hmm. ML adoption that actually was really valuable for mm -hmm. everybody except for startups. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's interesting because AI historically has had a few of these AI winters, uh, uh, if you go back even like 20, 30 years. The, tech, the AI waves you're talking about were technology waves, right? Where people kept saying we're making progress in AI and they were doing different types of neural networks over time. Or, yeah. You know, way back in the day, it was like in the 70s, it was like expert systems and like yeah. ways to be predictive that way, which wasn't quite AI, right? Um, I think part of it too is the bar kept going up, right? Mm -hmm. You had like helicopters and planes that could land themselves in the 80s and 90s, right? Like it, there was progress. But the bar for what was considered AI kept going up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you saw this also in, a, in AI applied to games, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, AI will never be able to beat chess. And then you beat chess. And then you're mm -hmm. like, oh, AI will never be able to beat Go. And then you yeah. beat Go. And then AI will never beat diplomacy and human interaction games. And then, you know, Noam Brown does his research at Facebook, right? And so yeah. the bar keeps progressing as well in terms of what people consider to be the bar. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the other aspect of it is we had um, two really big architectural shifts in ML models um, over the last, I guess, seven years now. In 2015 or so, diffusion models were really invented, which was mm -hmm. the application of certain types of statistical physics models to AI. Mm -hmm. And that led to um, all the image generation products. So mm -hmm. that's stable diffusion. That's why diffusion is in the name, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that's mid-journey. Mid -journey. That's all these yeah. uh, you know companies. And then separate from that, you had the transformer um, architecture, yeah. which was invented in Google in 2017. Yeah. And that was the architecture that really underlies the understanding of language. And so th these are what people call large language models or mm -hmm. foundation models, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had two big technology breakthroughs. Whenever you have the technology breakthrough, it takes some time, right? Yeah. So I think it wasn't until 2019 that people really started re implementing transformers, right? I don't yeah. know if, people, if you've seen that chart of... Um, number of ML and AI papers over time. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's this giant exponent. Mm -hmm. And so in all that noise, you have to pick out the architecture that's interesting mm -hmm. right, from all those papers. Yeah, yeah. So it takes a little bit of time. You experiment with it, you scale it, you try it, you try some use cases, and suddenly some interesting things start to happen. Mm -hmm. And also there's very strong scale effects, for example, with the transformer architecture that really emerge when you have massive scale of data that don't emerge at lower levels. So, um, so it just took a little bit of time. And then, um, you know, OpenAI basically bet the farm on um, these transformer-based models. So that was mm -hmm. GPT, right? General purpose transformer is what mm -hmm. GPT stands for. And eventually you had GPT 1, 2, 3, and now yeah. we're on 3.5. And, you know, mm -hmm. 4 will probably four. come out at yeah. some point this year. But one interesting phenomenon there is we had Noam Shazir on the show pretty recently, fantastic episode. And it's kind of interesting to see Google um, or Noam at Google and others at Google come up with, you know, the transfer model, self-attention, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of what has become you know, the canonical paper, uh, attention is all you need. But then it's actually a startup, uh, OpenAI, which went and ran with it. So there's some, some interesting unpacking there about like big company culture and startups bringing innovation to the scene. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it was um, conservatism, right? Because uh, Google had the talent, the capital, the compute, the um, data, all the resources to really build these things and they built them internally. So for example, Lambda is a yeah. chatbot mm -hmm. that Google yeah. had quite early yeah. and it's, it's similar to uh, chat GPT now. Mm -hmm. Right. And Noam, um, who you mentioned left to start character, yeah. which is a chatbot company, I think in part because he realized that it was so compelling, but Google wasn't really moving to commercialize it. Right. Mm. And so if you look at that paper of the eight authors on it, six of them have started companies. Right. 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 And so you had this sort of exodus of people go and then say, okay, we can't necessarily ship something here for now. So let's go do it somewhere else. And I think there's been recent announcements now from Google saying, okay, we're going to start commercializing these things more aggressively and offering mm -hmm. them more broadly. And, and they didn't want to ship it before because of just safety and safety. I think it's safety and perception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Well, safety, I think, uh, well, there's a whole other tangent, which I, we can probably go on, which is like, you know, sort of culture wars and perception and so on. But I want to maybe, on the startup founder topic, uh, you know, the AI 
market map, so to speak, for 2023? What do you see? Because there is infrastructure, the, you know, uh, um, you know, the, everything. Use from the, cases. Yeah, starting from the hardware on to yeah, infrastructure, sure. all the way to, you know, uh, you know, chatbots who can sure. speak like uh, Elon Musk to you. That's up and down the stack. So yeah. wh- wh- what do you see the stack, the map as right now? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you really want to start at the very bottom, then you have... Um, you know, the semiconductor layer, and that's really mainly NVIDIA. There's a couple of startups, Cerebras and um, uh, Grok and a few others working mm. in this area. Mm. I'm surprised that there aren't more startups actually on the chip layer. And there's a whole thesis I have around just the aging of that industry, like literal mm. aging of the people in the industry oh. um, <laughs> as a driver of um, a lack of innovation. It's not just the people, but the institutions and the lack of startup formation means eventually there's less and less startup formation. Mm-hmm. And so semiconductors, actually, there's very little activity from a founder perspective. Um, and that may be one of the ah. reasons there isn't a chip company that's emerged to truly challenge NVIDIA over the many years that it was clear that something should emerge. Um, so anyhow, there's the semiconductor layer. Uh, there's obviously the cloud service providers on which a bunch of this stuff is built um, who have either cloud GPUs or TPUs. Um, then on top of that, I think you really segment by three areas. Mm. There's image gen, foundation models, and then unfairly everything else. Mm-hmm. And everything else is everything from bio modeling and protein folding on through to robotics. Yeah. And they're completely different and completely different markets, but I'm going to put them aside for a minute because yep. everybody's focused on the first two. First mm-hmm. two, yeah. Um, and then in, within those first two, you have um, people who are building both the underlying models and the applications like MidJourney mm-hmm. and image gen or open AI in um, chat GPT plus the underlying mm-hmm. foundation model or the codex stuff, you know, that turned into GitHub Copilot. Um, but you have this, this sort of platform layer of AI platforms, right? And that's open AI. That's probably going to be Google. That's Anthropic. That's a few other companies. Um, and then you have a bunch of apps built on top of that. And those apps may be things like Jasper, which is tools to help marketers write content. Yeah. It's, um, Copilot from GitHub to help yeah. you write code. It's, yeah. it's all these sort of tools to, help you translate these these models into actions. Mm-hmm. So one, this is super fascinating because the, I think in some ways, you know, the question a lot of people are trying to unpack is where does value, maybe two part question. One, where does value accrue to various parts of, you know, this map that you laid out? Um, especially with the second part of the question, when you have some of some really large companies, Google, Microsoft, obviously, uh, you know, uh, making deep moves. Some of these require like very deep capitalization. So where do you see value accruing? How do you see the est- the mama players? Mama. Mama. I don't- <laughs> stick to Fang if you're uh, right. Stick to Fang. Uh, 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 I'm going to mean this. I'm trying to help you, Eli. Yeah, uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, it. Uh, 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 you know, the mom players to jump yeah. into this. Yeah. So um, I'm going to make a prediction, which is probably wrong, right? And so... We're going to put this on Twitter. There's a lot of predictions that are wrong. No, it's uh, great. I'll be like Twitter Domus. So I think... Um, <laughs> I would kind of split. Uh, there's basically three real potential future worlds for the mm. API layer. Because yeah. the reality is apps, of course, are going to exist. Yeah, yeah. Right? And there'll be different apps for different things. And some yeah. of the value of the app, like maybe the AI sales tool will end up being Salesforce, or maybe it'll be a new player, right? But yeah. there'll be some apps that incorporate this stuff in a rich way. And we'll create entirely new categories for legal and accounting and medicine and all these things. And in other cases, we'll be competing with incumbents. And sometimes the incumbents will win and sometimes they won't, right? So I'll put the apps aside because I think there'll be enormous value there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's non-controversial. At least I'm, I'm assuming so. I guess at one point of controversy there is people often say, oh, if it's just a wrapper around open AI, it's not that interesting. And it's not defensible as a business. And I think that's actually a super interesting area because the workflow built around that wrapper is actually the important part. Yeah, of that's the important piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a wrapper or not. I think there is just a lot of these, I look at it as just solving for mundane human labor and just like filling out fields, filling out description box, mm-hmm. like, you know, that stuff, it doesn't matter if it's a wrapper on OpenAI. If somebody's solving that entire workflow use case for me, I would use it. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and some people think otherwise. So that's why yeah. I think like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I, some people think it's controversial. I'm like, it seems reasonable. It's fine. Yeah. Um, on the AI la- on the API layer, um, there's three potential worlds. One world, it's, it's TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Corp, like where all the value aggregates to mm-hmm. one player with enormous scale. Mm-hmm. And it's not really a competitive market. And you could argue the most likely candidate today for that would be OpenAI because they're the only one really in market. Yep. There's Anthropic and others who are now coming. And, <laughs> it, and if Google enters, obviously that changes. The second view of the world, which I think is the most likely one, is that it's an oligopoly market. There's mm. multiple players competing with each other. And the most likely competitors are OpenAI aligned with Microsoft, Google. Um, and then I'm assuming that these things will get integrated into all the cloud providers. So Azure, 
AWS yeah. and uh, GCP. Yeah. And so Google will have its own solution. Microsoft is now with OpenAI. Mm -hmm. And so that means AWS or Amazon may need to partner with somebody. Mm -hmm. And so that's Anthropic or that's, they already have a deal with stability. It may be a different approach um, for them to enter the market. And then there may be an independent player that's just running on its own, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's a second view of the world, which I think is most likely. Mm -hmm. And then a third view of the world is, well, we're going to, scale doesn't matter. And the cost of building these things won't keep going up. Some mm -hmm. friend of mine keeps saying that's his contrarian viewpoint on this. Um, and therefore, it fragments into a bunch of niche models doing very specialized things. And there's a few big, giant open source models. And that's that's the future. Um, I think mm -hmm. that may be the future in a very long time from now, however mm -hmm. you want to define long time in technology cycles. Because I think the most similar analogy to all this is a semiconductor world, where in the 90s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, the microprocessor on your computer was highly differentiated yeah. if it was one generation ahead. Yeah. In other words, Intel was always a generation ahead of ahead AMD of and others. Audience. It cost 10 times as much to buy that specific chip. Mm -hmm. It was very proprietary. You built a fab, a factory to build these chips that cost billions of dollars. And each fab cost more than the last one. Mm -hmm. So it went from 100 million to half a billion to a billion, et cetera. And so you had a real capital moat. Nobody mm -hmm. could enter the market, right? And the, the most recent generation of chips everybody would buy would be super expensive. And then a generation or two later, it's 10 cents on the dollar or a penny on the yeah. dollar and everybody could use it for everything. Yeah. I think the models are going to be the same. If you assume that GPT-4 from scratch would cost, I'm making up a number, 50, $100 million to build um, with all the errors you make the first time around, mm -hmm. whatever. And then G a GPT-5 equivalent is 200 million and GPT-6 is 500 and GPT-7 is a billion or whatever curve you want to extrapolate. Mm -hmm. uh, that means eventually you have these big capital moats. Mm -hmm. uh, but each earlier generation model is going to be dramatically cheaper to, to train. So if you have GPT-7, training a GPT-5 or GPT-4 equivalent may be a million dollars right. at that time. Right. right. And so that means that all the use cases that those... Will be two generations behind mm -hmm. or so. One take on the you know the second scenario, the one where it requires that Bell's going to become an oligopoly and you know cap and maybe the ability to raise capital is actually even a moat in itself, um, is it's somewhat maybe depressing for startups. Basically, it's a view of the world where... You know, there are a couple of folks who raise several hundred million million dollars, um, and there's only a few kind of places where you can probably do that from, and then everybody else is really locked out, which is kind of a different world than the one where everybody could raise a seed round and then have a real go at yeah. it. But you can do that in image gen, right? And so training an image gen model is half a million mm -hmm. or a couple hundred thousand to a couple million dollars, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, I think Ahmad from Stability Sorry. tweeted once that you know, one version of stability that he mentioned, uh, of stable diffusion that he mentioned costs like 600 KGP mm -hmm. or something to train, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so the image inside is very cheap and it's going to be commoditized faster in some ways than the, these big language models. And that's why earlier on I segmented that. Yeah. I said, yep. these are very different uh, market segments. The architecture underlying them is different. The amount of mistakes you can make is different. If you mm -hmm. swap two pixels in an image, who cares? If you mm -hmm. swap two words in a paragraph, it could change the entire meaning. Yeah. Right? The fidelity is different. There's lots of changes. Oh, right? Use cases on top. The applications mm -hmm. you can write on top are also look, they are very different for both of these, yeah. right? So. so going to maybe the top of the stack, you know, what are, and this is kind of a question which gets rolled out often, but I'm curious to get your take on it. Like what are app level use cases that A, excite you, B, that you don't think enough people are thinking about? Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of them. I think fundamentally, anything that includes highly repetitive um, white collar work or email work or whatever you want to call it, mm. I think, uh, or spreadsheet work, you know, all those things are going to be, um, and by email work, I mean, people who spend a lot of time in their email oh, mm -hmm. yeah. or in a spreadsheet or at a coding terminal or, you know, uh, at a laptop in one form or another, like a lot of that work will have workflows wrapped around AI and that's going to be um, shifted over to an application. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I think there's tons of stuff. It's it's a huge part of our economy, right? Yeah. Um, it's medicine, it's um, parts of education, it's it's all the professional services, accounting, legal, et cetera. Um, it may be consumer apps around search, and maybe social products. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of different things, and so uh, I think there's an enormous amount of room right now for innovation because of this technology shift. Yeah. And that creates a huge opening for founders. I mean, it's a lot cheaper now to do that. And uh, also, since we've never done it before, there's so much training data that's manual mm -hmm. that you can feed. And it, and it's like with this current environment, it's cost saving, which is incredibly lucrative. Like value prop is like very yeah. aligned with all of these companies who mm -hmm. want it. 
So I, I see like that to be the first big set of use cases that mm-hmm. will like catch fire. Oh. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, and, and code is a good example of something yeah. that immediately yeah. started working. Yeah. I mean, Copilot is probably the first large modern AI rollout at scale. Uh, get a GitHub Copilot, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably true. That, I mean, Jasper supposedly is at pretty good scale. Mm. The image and stuff is at massive scale, right? Mm. Midjourney, um, if you look at the apps built on top of Stable Diffusion, like Lenza mm-hmm. and some of those oh, yeah. Are, yeah. are in huge usage. Yeah, and uh, so, I just look natively chiseled and look <laughs> that good. That, that is not Lenza. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think um, if you actually looked at the top 10 apps in, in the App, app store, store, like yeah, five Lenza of them were yeah. Yeah, a period apps, of time yeah. based on Stable Diffusion, right? And yep. so you know, fundamentally, these things are already being very impactful in the mm-hmm. background. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily think, oh, that's an AI app. You think, oh, that's kind of like a cool app where I can manipulate like images Instagram, myself, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Um, one question I think a lot of people would have when you mentioned the white collar uh, workflows uh, being replaced by AI is what happens to human beings who were actually doing those workflows and, you know, which now GPT-4 or 4.5 yeah. or 5 can actually do them for you? Yeah, it depends on the field, right? There's lots of fields that are actually understaffed that this will just help with. So for example, yeah. certain aspects of medicine, yeah. you don't have sufficient staffing or nursing or other areas like that. Um, you know, it's funny, in the prior wave of AI, one of the big things that everybody was talking about was self-driving cars and trucks and how that was gonna displace all the truck drivers. And I remember actually being invited, like, I don't know how many years ago now, six, seven years ago, because I'm mm-hmm. an investor in one or two of these self-driving companies, um, to an event and there was like senators there who were like, what do we do with all the truck, truck drivers? drivers? What are we gonna do with all the jobs? Yeah. And in hindsight, two things were happening. One is the average age of truck drivers then were in their mid-50s. So a mm-hmm. lot of people were going to retire. Young people didn't want to be truck drivers. There was going to be a huge hole in terms of labor markets. And so having this self-driving technology was going to probably be a net positive, right? Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes these things are very real and very disruptive and sometimes they're overstated. And the real question is when in the person's career are you impacting it? Is it mm-hmm. an augmentation versus a displacement? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, how do you think about um, the broader world? So say, for example, anybody around the world through their phone could get access to the level of healthcare that you could get at Stanford, mm-hmm. right? You get the best cardiologist in the world. You get the best cancer specialist in the world. And it's all through your phone and through an AI. That's yeah. incredibly that's powerful. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That is such a, I love that because that's such a techno-optimist view of the world. In some ways, it's kind of the heart of what yeah, we do. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and I think to Ilad's first point on some of these are understaffed. I, another way to put it is like, there are people who don't want to do this. Like, you know, we just don't have enough people who are willing to do this incredibly boring work. And uh, it's like filling out specific forms, documents, whatever. Like, it's just not... It, there's just lots and lots of people who are like willing to do literally anything else, get yeah. like reeducated on something else, pick up new skill set, and that's kind of why you see this like labor gap in available like demand versus supply, right? And I think if you're able to bring in AI to go solve that gap, it solves a problem for you. And I don't think the right access to take on is like jobs and what happens to jobs being taken away. I think that's like one way to look at it, but it's not like the central way to look at it. Some of these are just really understaffed and mm-hmm. don't have enough people. Yeah. Maybe one last thing on AI. Uh- how, how do we know that this is not yet another AI summer to be followed by AI winter? Because there has been similar hype in the past when we kind of talking about like history, like w- w- what is yeah, different sure. now? Yeah, I remember um, when AlexNet came out on the machine vision side, I said, okay, like this is, there's mm-hmm. going to be a dozen interesting startups here. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the value there again went to the incumbents, mm-hmm. right? In terms of um, aspects of machine vision, but there are also startups that got up and running in, in biotech and other areas that use machine vision in different ways. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I think fundamentally the reason this time feels different is because the technology basis is so much stronger mm-hmm. and you already see large scale use cases starting to kick in mm. like Copilot and like some of the image gen stuff. And so, you know, there's a real need here. Mm-hmm. And so minimally, we know that there's going to be a few probably very large companies or outcomes from this just off of that. Yep. Yep. Right. And yep. so it's a little bit pre-baked, I feel this time. The other space which uh, you've been spending a lot of time on and think a lot about is energy. Uh Curious, when did you get started in, in energy? Yeah. Because that is not something, you know, AI, everyone in Silicon Valley pays attention to. Yeah. Energy, I think not, I think more and more people are starting to pay attention to it, especially nuclear, but not historically. When did you start getting yeah. interested in it? Yeah, and I wouldn't say that I'm deep on it. I just, I would say I've had an interest in it for a while. So um, I remember like before I started uh, Color, me and a friend um, who's gone on to do some very interesting things. I'll tell you who it is after uh, mm-hmm. this. Uh, went on a tour of all the um, nuclear labs that we could find and all the nuclear startups and we just talked to them to see because nuclear was such an obvious thing to do and if you look at safety profiles and energy production and all the rest of it 
And so for, for a while I've been interested in it. And then simultaneously in 2007, I think, or something like that, when I left Google, I set up one of the world's first um, consumer offset sites for carbon footprint, where you could go in and you could put in a bunch of information about yourself and it'd tell you how, to, how much you needed to pay to offset your carbon. And then we'd buy you know, effective carbon offsets for you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so we launched that and we got like $20 worth of um, business. I think my mother <laughs> went on the website or something because people didn't really care that much. And so I was interested in these. Uh, now should, now uh, it is super yeah. hot, the whole carbon offset. You, you should yeah, make it an acquisition to pick up your uh, Davos badge. To use that product right there. Yeah. And, and, and now, I mean, you, you could have yeah. been funding some trees being planted in Brazil. Could have. Could have, yeah. should have, would have. Right? <laughs> and, so, um, and so I was really interested in this dual thing of like climate and um, or carbon emissions and then energy. And if you assume that there would be some impact of carbon levels going up. And by the way, if you actually look at the data, what, is, uh, what year did um, we peak in terms of uh, carbon dioxide emissions per capita in the US, or when will we peak? The first question is, is it in the past or is it in the future? Uh, I am going to be an optimist about all the things that have happened and say it's probably in the past. So can I pick 2010? 2010, what do you think? Uh, no, I think it's more like like industrial revolution types, oh. like you know, way back. Oh I think wow! It's okay. Like, uh, okay. Yeah, All right. Fifties, like sixties, yeah. or something. I don't know. Yeah, it depends on your metric, really. Yeah. Um, you know, one point of view is it's effectively 1979, at yeah. least for parts of the Western world. Okay. For the U.S., uh, we're now, and COVID is probably a distorter, so I want to see what this data look like. Right. Last year, we were basically um, at the same levels as the 1920s in the U.S. Wow. Okay. Uh, per, per, per capita. Okay. Right? Wow. Not overall. Yeah. Um, because we have a growing population. Okay, so true industrial then, revolution time frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And then you can really? also make arguments around, well, some of that production shifted to China, so you have yeah, to look yeah, at that, yeah. part, right? But yeah. Fundamentally, we've actually made enormous progress in terms of uh, uh, climate footprint. Yeah. And the, the, the two countries that are really driving things in the opposite direction are China and to a lesser extent India mm -hmm. mm. in terms of output. But the reality is like the Western world has actually brought its footprint down dramatically per mm. capita. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And that's never talked about. So anyhow, I got interested in this stuff. I started looking at nuclear because nuclear is one of the most rational ways to actually uh, create large amounts of abundant energy. Wait, hold on. You should explain yeah. that because I think, uh, you know, that's actually, we're going to have more guests and in the future. It's so to hard to, to reconcile that with shutting down nuclear reactors. Yeah. Well, I would say, yeah, okay, we're going to get more guests yeah. on our show to talk about nuclear, uh, yeah. and we're talking to a few, but I think unless you're kind of read a bit about this topic or kind of maybe spend some time paying sure. attention, there is a prevailing view, which is nuclear is danger, right? Chernobyl. Mushroom clouds, Chernobyl, yeah, Fukushima, yeah, yeah. but that's not, the, well, let, I'll let you explain. Yeah. Like, why do you say sure. it's the most rational? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. If you actually look at the history of nuclear energy, um, the if you look at surveys of the U.S. population, the U.S. population was very positive on it mm. until the mid-1970s when the oil lobby plus the green movement tried to shut it down. Ah. And they were very effective in creating this perception that it's dirty and that it's dangerous, mm. right? And it wasn't until the 80s when I think you had like Three Mile Island and things like that that mm -hmm. it really like... They, they use that as an example to try and drive home the point. If you actually look, uh, people should just go to the Wikipedia page on nuclear accidents over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I've um, seen it. The yeah. So the total number of deaths from nuclear over time from nuclear accidents are minuscule. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Fukushima, it was, um, I think one person actually died from the... Radiation. But, but radiation. it wasn't from the radiation, it was from the, I yeah. think, if I remember, something happened later, it was from the evacuation. Yeah, there's some people who died from the evacuation who were elderly, yeah. like, it's a very small number of people who have actually died, and if you actually do the math, more people per year are likely to be dying, falling off of roofs and stolen solar, than have died uh, from nuclear accidents, right? And so, you mm -hmm. end up with this very distorted view of safety, and that's purposeful, right? There's an agenda to try and shut down nuclear capacity, and you mm -hmm. look at some countries like France, 70% of their energy production is still nuclear, nuclear and they're fine. Yeah. You don't yeah. hear about French nuclear accidents happening on a regular basis or any basis. Well, right? I think this is super interesting, okay? Because I think this cuts into, let me make this podcast sure. a little spicy here, right? This cuts into two topics I think a lot about. One is things which should not be polarized politically, left or right, becoming polarized. Sure. So for example, one would say that if, you know, the idea of having clean energy is a more progressive leftist cars, you would think that you would probably be in favor of all things nuclear. But it's often not the case. Like when you often think nuclear, it is often more coded conservative mm -hmm. or sure. to the right. That's not interesting. That's I mean, why did that happen? Yeah. I don't know if the right is pro-nuclear. 
Um, I think the left is definitely anti-nuclear, but it's possible the right is a little bit anti-nuclear too, right? Um, I don't think there's a, I haven't heard of such a thing as a strong consensus in any political group Mm -hmm. that's pro-nuclear, except for maybe some centrists who are just like rational thinkers or something, right? Because uh, fundamentally the accident rate is low. Nuclear waste is both a small amount, but you could also just literally put it back in the mines with certain type of containment from which it came, right? You're mining uranium Mm -hmm. from somewhere. Um, and, uh, fundamentally you have very clean, uh, stable energy production in the context of nuclear power plants. And so I think there was a purposeful set of tactics to try and scare the population into thinking that nuclear was a bad thing and it worked. Why? Why did they scare the population? Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, on the one hand, there's big oil who just, obviously it's a competitive threat. I think on the environmental lobby side, I think um, if you look at the history of the environmental lobby, it's traditionally been very anti-technology and anti-growth yeah. mm. and anti-abundance. Mm. And if you go back to the um, late 60s, for example, there were these books, like I think there was a book called like The Population Explosion. Oh, yeah. And there was all these books that basically said the world is going to end through overpopulation and mass famine. You should have fewer children. You should stop consuming things. Mm-hmm. You should do less, 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 less. And I mean, even in India, as growing up, this was kind right. of ingrained in our heads on uh, we two, ours two, and then it became we two, ours yeah, one, yeah, um, and, and then the one child policy in China. This is like overpopulation was the thing that was consistently talked about through our childhood on like how this is going to cause the end of the world. Yeah, which way I yeah. think somebody like Elon is so focused on just people having babies um, because that's been a crisis. I mean, it's like a crisis even in India now. Yeah. But I think you are getting at the heart of it because the heart of it kind of becomes, are you pro-growth or yeah. are you against growth? I basically view it as like the scarcity agenda versus the abundance agenda. Mm-hmm. And the scarcity agenda is everything is for safety and regulation. Do less, have less energy and, and power in the world, have less technology, don't have children, constrain, constrain, constrain. Yeah. And the arguments are often, oh, we're doing it for the betterment of mankind of the world without mm-hmm. any real sense of what that means. Mm-hmm. It's just this vague thing you say to make yourself feel like there's a reason behind it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, there's this abundance agenda, which is, well, you should be using the right energy source for the right purpose. You should be moving to clean energy sources whenever you can. Technology could help decarbonize if we actually invested in it. Um, but also, like, energy is an input into everything that you do, and it drives down cost for everything in society. Mm-hmm. Yep. So if you have abundant energy, you have abundant food. Mm-hmm. You have abundant um, compute. You have abundant yeah. everything in life. Like right? Mark would say, I will not eat bugs. Yeah, yeah, Mark a whole episode on oh, yeah, that. That's a great yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ignoring bugs is just abun- uh, mm-hmm. energy abundance creates abundance yeah. and uh, everything being less expensive. So it's a giant deflationary force. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because... Um, Right now, a lot of the climate movement, and again, I was very early into doing yeah. things for climate, is uh, you'll literally see articles of you shouldn't have children because of climate change. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. And that's just silly, right? And so I think I'm really we on literally the... talk to people, our friends who believe in this. It just, I can't. It's like we are in different planets. Yeah. I can't even imagine how a rational person, incredibly educated, qualified can make a statement like that. Sure. And then you bring up nuclear and probably that same person is anti-nuclear. Oh, yes. And so it's a bundle of beliefs. And you're like, well, there is a solution. If you really, really, really care about the about the climate and the environment, you should set up a bunch of nuclear power plants if you actually look at data. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that's really hard, right? I mean, um, in the US, regulatorily, I mean, it's kind of this amazing thing where the NRC, Mm. the commission which regulates this is often in the business of making sure nothing happens. Yeah, uh, yeah. the last time a new nuclear uh, power plant design was approved was in the 1970s. 70s, yeah. mm-hmm. And that means it was based on 60s technology. Mm-hmm. And so the world of nuclear power works on 1960s technology and it still works fine. That's how robust the technology is. That's how well it works, mm-hmm. right? You don't need thorium. You don't need Mung core reactors. You don't need all this fancy stuff. There's things you can do for better safety. But again, the safety profiles are quite good. Yeah. And so it's, it's not a matter of can you do it? We mm-hmm. clearly can do it. We do it on nuclear submarines all the time. You don't hear about them melting down regularly, yeah, right? And we have yeah, yeah. lots of nuclear submarines. Um, it's just a matter of will. Yeah. There's another interesting geopolitical angle to this because if you look at the, what's happened to Ukraine and as a fallout of that, uh, you have, for example, you said France, uh, sure. you know, which you know, made a long-term call bet on nuclear, which is proving to be incredibly smart. On the other hand, you have a country like Germany or other parts of Europe, which you know made the fateful decision, one would say, to shut down all the nuclear efforts, and now literally are in the process of cutting down forests to you know to burn them. Yeah, for they're, they're they're burning um, trees and coal because they shut off their nuclear power plants, yeah. which are zero like people thousands plants. of years ago, which is 
Yeah, no, it's, it's insane and it's huge carbon footprint. And so again, you're, you're kind of doing the wrong things for what you claim are the right reasons, but they're the wrong reasons, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, it's, it's back to this as a political agenda. This is not a rational agenda. Mm -hmm. This is not actually trying to solve a problem. This is trying to contort things around a political viewpoint. And so, that political viewpoint, I think, is that scarcity agenda. So if you're a founder, though, um, I know that there are a lot of interesting companies in nuclear, et cetera, sure. but there's still like a big regulatory overhang. Yeah. You know, if you're a founder, what's the outlook here? Yeah, you know, I think it depends on which part. Do you mean for energy or do you mean for um, climate? Uh, let's think about energy first. Yeah, you know, um, I think energy is a little bit tougher. Obviously, we've made huge advances in solar uh, you know, we've seen a really strong cost curve there. So that's been sort of a positive angle. A lot of the limitations of, are, of course, with battery technology mm -hmm. and the ability to actually transmit um, things over a larger grid or larger footprint. Um, and that's why you want local storage of energy so that when there's sunlight, you can store it locally. And when, um, you know, there isn't, you can then, you yeah. know, use that for local transmission. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it falls more into the realm of like material sciences mm. or business model mm -hmm. than it does into like software. Although yeah. there are a bunch of companies now trying to build software for, um, everything from like electric car utilization, and all, you know, all sorts of different things. But, mm. um, you know, fundamentally it feels like a lot of these yeah. things have to do with regulation or material sciences. Yeah. Have you been following the, the recent advancements in, um, uh, in fusion, for example, Helion has. Had some announcements. Yeah, I've been following it somewhat. Um, you know, my sense is everybody's working towards uh, larger and larger prototypes with the hope that eventually these things can be commercialized. And many of the commercialization timelines I've heard of are reasonably far in the future. And yeah. so, yeah, you know, I think um, the fusion stuff is really interesting and really exciting. The flip of it is we could do fission right now if we wanted to, traditional nuclear power. <laughs> um, and it, it's just regulatory and, well, and, you know, marketing, right? Marketing. Yeah. Marketing, yeah. yep. Uh, one person I think we only have on the show uh, is Emmett Penny. He has this amazing site called Nuclear Barbarians. You should check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, he, he uh, there are people trying to tackle the marketing side of nuclear in some interesting ways. Uh, but there is a sense of energy and will, uh, we can hope. Okay. Um, maybe, you know, one last sort of theme is um, you've been really interested, I would say, in talent in human capital in a lot of ways. So sure. I know you have theories on human capital flows in society, and then I have some offshoot questions on people and networks. But talk to us about sure. human capital flow. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I, I don't know that I've thought that deeply about it. I think fundamentally, if you look societally, we've had these really big displacements of human capital mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, parts of that is rural versus urban and sort of massive uh, mass migration in different countries. And that's really changed how you think about local density of, you know, mm -hmm. talented or smart people. Mm -hmm. um, you have this historical view that almost every major movement is started by a small number of young people. And that's art movements like, um, uh, you know, Favism or uh, Impressionism or you name it. That's mm -hmm. literary movements. That's technology movements, right? It's always the same 20 people who are in their 20s and 30s doing interesting right, things. Right. A lot of the... Um, uh, and, and so there, I think there's two separate themes. One is where are the really talented people and what are they doing? Uh, and secondly, how has society shifted its allocation of people? Mm -hmm. And those are related. And so, for example, if you look at it, 50, 60, 70 years ago, there was very few jobs available to women. And so a lot of women became nurses, they became teachers, they took on certain professions. And that means if the very best women in the world were limited there was amazing exceptional people in those roles. Hmm. And there still are, but maybe the, the density of that has shifted because those same people now are working at Google on machine learning systems right. or whatever it may be. Right. And so we've seen these big movements societally of capital, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. human capital. You can think of different theories in terms of the implications of certain industries sucking up all, a lot of the very good people. Mm -hmm. And that's probably at some point to the detriment of other industries. Hmm. And so you can kind of map where did people go by field over time. Yeah. And people used to do different things around IQ testing or other things. And obviously there's flaws in those tests, but there's also some benefit in them. And you can see that in certain fields, the average IQ has been dropping over time mm. because people have been migrating out of certain fields into other mm -hmm. fields, right? And so what does that mean societally? And yeah. how should we think about rewarding certain professions so that we pull human capital back into certain areas that are now potentially lacking it? If we truly believe like software is eating the world mm -hmm. and everything's going to be software enabled or it already is mm -hmm. to some extent. And in that case, then people moving into tech and like the ROI on like intellectual horsepower mm -hmm. 
is really, really good, right? Like, you know, for like X number of mm. people coming in, yeah. Y industries will all move forward. Isn't that a good thing for like concentration in technology as such? Up to a point. I mean, don't you want really, and I'm not saying there aren't, but don't you want really smart people in government? Don't you want really smart people teaching your kids? Don't you want really smart people as your physician? So there's lots and lots of areas where I want really smart people. Right. I'm not saying they're there or not there. I'm just mm -hmm. saying you actually want a spread of really smart people yeah. throughout society for all sorts of functions. If you take the extreme view of that and you say, what if every single smart person was magically just at Google? Yeah. That'd be really bad for society, right? Yeah. Um, but the free market will take care of well, that, Well, I was going to say, right? this, this is really on, is capitalism the best allocator of human interest? And if capital? I don't have good teachers for my kids, I guess I would sure. be willing to pay more for that one Theoretically, teacher right? But that's not yeah. quite what's happening societally. Okay. Huh. Um, and so I agree with that, but yeah. there, there is uh, some disconnect. And part of that is maybe the people would normally be going and setting up schools that would then go and attract those amazing teachers where they get paid dramatically more yeah. are still working at Google and spending all their time on that. Yeah. Right. And so yeah, because they're opportunity We've literally cost talked is high. about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in the, with um, respect to schools and teachers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think it's, I think it's a real thing. Yeah. You see that in terms of, um, who's running for, um, local government in certain cities and what's the opportunity cost of doing that in the city. Yeah. And so I yeah. think I think it has a real effect societally that you've drained a lot of human capital in very specific directions over time. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you reverse that flow? Like, what's the solution? How do you incentivize these other pockets to have better concentration of people? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great question, and you kind of have to go through pocket by pocket and ask yeah. how do you do that. Or to yeah. your point, other circumstances where you augment. Uh, with technology so that, yeah. you know, you have fewer people, but they can do dramatically more because they have the tooling mm -hmm. to do that, be it teaching or medicine or, you know, yeah. Name, yeah. programming, yeah. right? For yeah. software engineers, it could be all sorts of things. But I, I do think it's it's something that's kind of under-discussed and not really thought about in terms of this stuff. And then relatedly, that's, you know, um, as mentioned, there are these small groups of people who tend to drive really big societal movements. And mm. so I think there's a separable question mm -hmm. of how do you identify that subset of people, people. globally? Yeah. yeah which Maybe zooming in, I think that brings me to something I wanted to ask you about because I think one of your real uh, superpowers is being close to the smart builders of every generation. And you've done it for like a few generations, cohorts of founders, as you said. So how do you do that? How do you basically get close to the interesting set of people building things every few years? Because you've done that with, say, for example, the Stripe Mafia or before that, the Google Mafia. And there's always like a new mafia around. How do you do that? Um, you know, I don't know how well or poorly I do it. I think fundamentally I um, get very interested in different new technology waves. Mm. And often, at least in the technology industry, those are the things that drive progress. Mm. And as mentioned, I'm very techno-optimistic. I love uh, technology. I, I, I love thinking about the implications of it. I think startups are a motive force to sort of spread it throughout the world in a mm -hmm. positive way. And so I just love getting involved with these things. And, you know, for example, on the AI side, as mentioned, I've been working on it in one form or another for now, you know, 16 years or whatever, that, yeah. you know, longer than that maybe. Um, uh, and so it, it's always been an interest, but I think like four or five years ago, I got really interested in AI driven art back when it was mainly GAN driven. And I remember going very deep on that and thinking of starting like an AI art, art studio and looking mm -hmm. at 3D printing technology so you could actually substantiate it in a physical form and all this stuff. And so then it made it really easy to dive back into the generative stuff, say, two years ago, simply because I was already pre-tuned to it and looking mm -hmm. into it and reading mm -hmm. the papers. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think sometimes you just kind of follow your nose in terms of what's interesting. And mm -hmm. um, that's often where the smartest people are is sort of at that frontier. Right, right. Well, I think you've been amazing at that. Okay, maybe one last theme um, and to wrap this up, uh, we ask a lot of our guests this, which is, you know, uh, look if you had to look back several decades in the future, you know, from some, you know, sentient Elard AI and you're looking back on all these decades here, like what would make you go, okay, that was like job well done. You know, I did good work over a few decades or more. Yeah. Jeez. That's a good question. I think there's like probably four or five aspects of it. I'm going to put aside the familial and societal aspects of mm -hmm. those because, uh, you know, there's, um, I remember a friend of mine used to view it as like, there are these, um, over these con concentric circles of life, right? Earlier in your life, you're focused on just your studies. Mm. And then a little bit later in life, you're focused on your career. And then the, later in life, you're focused on your family. And then after that society, and then eventually you go out in the hills and you become a sadhu and you focus <laughs> on like spirituality or whatever. Right. And, um, <laughs> and obviously for different people, these things overlap in different ways in different phases of their life. But fundamentally you, you have these phases, right. That, that traditionally people used to go through. Mm. 
And so I'm going to put a, I'm going to put aside a lot of the other mm-hmm. phases in terms of you know family and spirituality mm-hmm. and society. Although I hope to have some impact there. Um, you know, from a, a career perspective, my hope is um, you know threefold. One is I can be involved or help foment the spread of useful technologies that can impact humanity in a positive way. And mm-hmm. so there's different ways you could potentially look at that or measure that. Everything from market cap of companies to number of people that color helped through COVID and through cancer and through mm-hmm. other things, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a company I started. Um, uh, second is, what is the impact you had on different people's careers, right? Are, are, are there cohorts of people that worked with you that went on to do amazing things? Yeah. And did you help them with those efforts? So I think that's another sort of work-centric thing to look back on. Uh, for some people, it's do you leave behind an institution or a platform or something else that you know lives on you after you? You have a building in your name. Yeah, do you have a building in your name? <laughs> Um, well, I don't know whether all those people are good. So yeah, but. yeah, and there may be other forms of that. Like, I don't think my book is going to survive a hundred years, but you could always imagine trying to write a book that lives a hundred. Right? People know more about Shakespeare than most of the business people who lived during that time. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Um, so I think there's lots of different ways to kind of think about impact or to measure it. Well, I love it, and I think you are an optimist about uh, human beings and technology, and that's kind of core to us and what we do here. And so yeah, I know. I think I. I uh, more to wrap it, like, I think I met you, Ilar, like, what, 10 years ago, maybe a little longer. And you kind of took a meeting with me without knowing me. You were just, like, gracious about it. I think at that time you were working on color. And you were just good with your, like, you just gave me advice on, I was starting out my first company then. It's just new to Silicon Valley. We didn't know a lot of people. But you were just, like, you opened doors, was helpful, connected me with a bunch of angel investors then, and... Uh, it meant a lot to me then because you just, uh, as it, we were not used to this positive sum thinking that Silicon Valley, now we know and we try to pay it forward to, uh, has. And uh, you were one of the early people where I was like, why is he being so nice? Like, what does he want in return? I don't get it. Um, and I that wanted was really to be awesome. on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that was the, 10 uh, years later, yeah, long gone yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. And thank you for doing that for so many founders. I mean, I think uh, Shriram says like you are like the Tom Bombadil mm-hmm. of the technology world. You are already an institution, Elon, <laughs> yeah, minus the building maybe. Yeah, no, you know, I appreciate you saying that. It's kind of funny. Um, there, there's somebody who did that for me like 10 years ago because I, I, I joined, I moved out here. I joined a startup. It grew to 160. It shrank to 13 people over five rounds of layoffs. I got laid off in the third round. And, um, you know, there's this prominent investor who... Um, uh, at the time, introduced me into a bunch of startups and effectively helped me stay here because I had no money. And I was like, if I don't get a job, I'm out. Like, yeah. I have to move away. Yeah. And I sent him a thank you email a couple years ago. I said, thank you so much. That was so meaningful. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And he wrote back and he's like, I don't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I feel like that's just the ethos of like Silicon Valley. And I don't know what the lesson to take from that is. Yeah, I mean, he said, oh, it's nice of you to say that. And, you know, who that, are you? you know, <laughs> no, no, you know, remember who I was, but like, he's like, oh, thanks for saying that. I didn't realize it was that big of an impact. I was just like, yeah. you know, trying to help out this company or whatever. So like, you know, I think, I think um, Silicon Valley or technology in general is built on that ethos. Yeah. And it's hard for people to understand it. And I also think when you have people LARPing, they don't necessarily contribute to it. But I do think there's a core of people who think this is like a good thing to work on yeah. and a useful thing to do. And therefore, these people all tend to help yeah. each other. Yeah. Eli, Mr. Silicon Valley, right there. Thank you so much. Thank this was a right, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.